We continue this morning with the general theme of the names of God. You will remember that for a number of weeks we were looking at particular names throughout the Old Testament uh, through which God revealed himself to us. The purpose of those names not being for God, but uh, that we might know who he is and respond to that, embracing him by faith as our Redeemer. We've had a lot of application along the way in, in each of those sermons so that we might make use of this revelation for our spiritual good. But I intend a few sermons uh, where I will make pointed application, specific application of the whole of these truths to our hearts. And this morning I direct your attention first of all to Romans chapter 10 verse 13 which has to be the first and most vital response of your heart to the declaration of God's name. Romans chapter 10, verse 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you miss this, then you've missed the entire point of our series of messages Indeed, you've missed the entire point of the whole of God's revelation in Scripture. God declares His name so that sinners like you and me can be saved. And in our text this morning, we have one of the broadest announcements of this truth in the Bible. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, of course, we're here in the book of Romans in the New Testament, but this text of Scripture has its roots in the Old Testament in the book of Joel. And if you turn there and look with me at chapter 2 and from verse 30 of the book of Joel, many years before the Lord said this, uh, Joel chapter 2 verse 30, And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. So many years before the New Testament, the Lord says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered or shall be saved, and that this would take place in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem. Well, he predicts a day that would come. And when we come into the New Testament, we discover that that day came on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And when Peter is preaching there from verse uh, 18, he refers to the words of the prophet Joel in Joel chapter 2. And Peter says, And on my servants and on mine handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then he begins to preach Christ. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs and so on. So Joel, Joel predicts this day and it comes to fruition in the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem and upon Mount Zion when God sends this deliverance and 3,000 souls call upon the name of the Lord and they're saved. But it's not just a declaration to Jews on the day of Pentecost. But when we come to the book of Romans and Paul is writing to a Gentile audience and he's speaking to them about the relationship of Jew and Gentile to the gospel, he comes back to the very same truth 
in Romans 10 and verse 12 and 13, saying, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, friends, this is a tremendously significant statement, but it's not a neat little formula. It's not what it has become to be used as in the church of Jesus Christ. You know, you have this idea that you can preach the gospel, have an appeal at the end of the service, invite people down to the front, take them into a back room uh, and get them to say the sinner's prayer. And at the end of that, you quote this verse, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You've called upon the name of the Lord, therefore you're saved. Uh, And the minister, in a kind of conveyor belt manner, brings a person to, quote, salvation and sends him away with the preacher's guarantee of assurance. Well, that is not what it means to call upon the name of the Lord. We're not saying that no one has ever been converted in that context, but that is not what it means to call upon the name of the Lord. This text is not an incantation. It's not a tool to compel men into a shallow uh, decision for Jesus. It's more complicated than that, but at the same time, it is still glorious in its simplicity. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, God's word to you and me this morning is simple. Call upon the name of the Lord. As we take this up, I want to open the subject in four ways. First of all, we'll consider the need of the sinner. Secondly, the name of the Lord. Thirdly, the cry of the soul. And fourthly, the promise to all. The need of the sinner, the name of the Lord, the cry of the soul, and the promise to all. So then, first of all, let's consider the need of the sinner. And that's clear from the use of the word salvation in our text. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If people are to receive salvation it's evident that they must be in a state of need. They must need to be saved. And so before you can call upon the name of the Lord, you have to first come to an appreciation of what that need is. So were you to go back to the book of Joel and read there that prophecy in more detail, you would discover Joel introducing that wonderful statement surrounded with the language of judgment. The sun is going to be darkened. The moon is going to be turned into blood. Chapter 3, there's a great army gathered together in the valley of Jehoshaphat, a day of decision. And the Lord says, the harvest has come. Put ye in the sickle because it is ripe. It's an image of judgment. Peter takes that up, of course, on the day of Pentecost, and he preaches it again in the shadow of impending judgment that would fall upon the very city of Zion and Jerusalem where he preached. And in that context, he preaches salvation through the name of the Lord. So you've got the context in Joel. You've got the message on the day of Pentecost as Peter preaches. But then when we find it in the book of Romans, it comes also in a context to us. And so you have to remember everything that Paul has been doing up until this point of time in the book. Going back to chapters 1 through 3, where he's prosecuting the case that all men, whether they be Jew and Gentile, they have one thing in common, and that is they are sinners. All are under sin. None is righteous. No, not one. And thus every man by nature is in a state of condemnation before God. To put it simply, children, you need to be saved because you are a sinner 
in the presence of a holy God who is set to condemn and judge that sin unless it is dealt with through this salvation. You come to our text, this glorious whosoever, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But that whosoever is so glorious because of other whosoever's that we meet throughout Scripture. Let me bring some of them to your attention. Turn please to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus is preaching in Galilee on the mountain. And in his Sermon on the Mount, he's opening up the law of God. And I wonder if you've ever noticed how often he uses the word whosoever. Matthew chapter 5, and look first of all at uh, verse 19. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But then verse 21 and verse 22, ye have heard that it was said of them, by them of old time, thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thy fool shall be in danger of hell fire. The sixth commandment, Thou shalt not kill, broken down, applied to our hearts, that we might learn that it's spiritual. It touches our thoughts, our words. It slays every one of us. And Jesus says, whosoever is guilty of this is in danger of hellfire. Then he continues, verse 27 and 28, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust, lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Murder is the angry word. Adultery is the lustful glance. And Jesus says, whosoever is guilty of these things has broken God's law and is condemned. I ask you, who is whosoever in these texts? And the answer is, whosoever is you, whosoever is me. You find it again in John's first epistle, chapter 3 and verse 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is transgression of the law. Who is whosoever in that text? we have the same answer, whosoever is you and whosoever is me. It's the whosoever of the law. And Paul has been spelling it out in the book of Romans. We are all under sin. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And therefore, the judgment of an eternal hell is coming. And you need to be saved. The whosoever of the law condemns us all. That's your need this morning. That's the need of the sinner. But what do we do with that need? Well, Paul introduces in the second place the name of the Lord. The need of the sinner is answered by the name of of the Lord. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now we've been considering this in detail over the last number of weeks. And so I want to bring to you two things that will be reminders of all that we've said. And the first is the name of the Lord is Jehovah. You need to know who it is that you're to call upon. The name of the Lord is Jehovah. Now, it's not evident in the first place from our text, 
But this word Lord or kurios in Greek is, of course, referring back to the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 32, where the word is Jehovah. Whosoever shall call upon Jehovah, the name of Jehovah, shall be saved. And we've learned that Jehovah is the eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the creator of all things, the covenant God of his people, a God who is infinite in his being, who is independent from all things, absolute in himself, in need of nothing, unchangeable, yet who has come to us not only through creation, but when we destroyed ourselves in sin, he comes to us and for us for our salvation. revealing his name, I am the Lord. Jehovah with all of those compound names that we considered. Well, have you not learned over these weeks that our all-sufficient Jehovah, the God of our salvation, meets our need at every point? as sinners. You're guilty. The sentence of death and an eternal hell is upon you. You need someone to take that condemnation and to die your death. In Old Testament terms, you need a lamb for the sacrifice. And we met God with Abraham on Mount Moriah, Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide himself a lamb for the sacrifice, and he did. But not only do you need one to die your death and pay the penalty of your guilt, you need one to provide you with a righteousness before God. And we met Jehovah said, Can you, the Lord, our righteousness, in whom sinners can stand clothed in the righteousness of God, dressed in the garment of salvation and welcomed by a holy God into a holy heaven. And then we look at ourselves and not only are we guilty, not only do we need righteousness before God, but we are corrupt and filthy in our sins. We have the white spot of the sin of leprosy blazoned upon our foreheads and the Lord comes to us as Jehovah Rophaica, I am the Lord that healeth you. And he heals all of our spiritual diseases and renews us by his grace after the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, transforming us in holiness before him. And then we have enmity between God and our souls. And Jehovah is Jehovah Shalom, the God who makes peace and reconciles guilty, filthy sinners unto himself. The name of the Lord is Jehovah, but the name of the Lord more specifically is Jesus. And we've seen this at every point in our study. Whether it is Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah said, can you, Jehovah Rufika, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Nissi, Jehovah Sabaoth, it's all ultimately fulfilled and revealed to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we discover the same thing here in Romans chapter 10. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But at every point, Paul is funneling our, our concentration and our focus towards faith in Jesus Christ. Listen to what he says in verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. And listen to what he says in verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. 
And it's having stated that, that he continues, verse 11, for the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible is very clear. There is one God and only one, the Lord Jehovah, creator, sustainer, and redeemer. And there is one Savior, God manifest in the flesh, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we are to call upon the name of the Lord in this sense, that it is Jehovah revealed in Jesus. And there is no other Savior that is able to meet the need that every sinner has. Oh, I quote it often, but it bears repetition. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The need of the sinner is addressed by the name of the Lord. Jehovah manifest in Jesus. Which brings us to the third thing. And that is the call of the soul. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, I say again, it's not the back room incantation and forced decision that Paul is speaking of here. So what is it? It's vitally important that we understand what Paul is saying here because salvation depends upon it. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So what is it to call upon God's name? Well, three things. First of all, it is a call of knowledge. It is a call of knowledge. I think you would agree that the book of Romans makes that very clear because Paul is appealing here to us after he has developed a very thorough and particular argument. Let's go back to chapter 3 and look there at verse 24 through 26. And remember that this is Paul beginning an answer to this problem that all are under sin. But he doesn't just say, believe in Jesus. Everybody's under sin, believe in Jesus. Because that wouldn't mean anything to anybody. They need to understand what that means to believe in Jesus. Well, listen to what he says. Verse 23, Romans chapter 3, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. These are loaded terms. Justification, redemption. Now he explains in verse 25, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. You, you hear it said uh, often, just give me the simple gospel. Well, here it is. This is Paul beginning an answer to the problem of our sin. Here's the simple gospel. God justifies sinners. God redeems sinners. Christ propitiates the wrath of God. God is just in that his law is fulfilled. His justice is intact. And yet he's the one who can declare the guilty just. Why? These are vitally important questions. It's not just Jesus is a wonderful name. Just call upon the name Jesus. Just believe in Jesus and everything will be well. He explains how God saved in Christ. How God is merciful and gracious. 
how God is righteous and just, how God's wrath needs to be appeased, how Christ has satisfied that for sinners, and therefore we can come confidently trusting in him, knowing that the whole scheme of salvation is perfect, and thus we have ground to hope in Christ, who died for our sins. Nowhere does the Bible say, just ask Jesus into your heart. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today. Come in to stay. Where do you find it in Scripture? Ah, oh, well, some might say, well, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We say, amen, it does. But it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that. And people encourage ignorant folk into a decision for Christ, which is so far removed in Christ, from Christian salvation that it is closer to blasphemy than leading them into the kingdom of God. It is a call of knowledge. Psalm 9 verse 10 puts it in this way. They that know thy name will place their confidence in thee. We need knowledge. You don't have to have an Ivy League education. But you do need to understand that you're a sinner who has broken God's law and you're condemned that God is holy and he is just, and that he will not pardon you unless you come to Jesus Christ. But that he will pardon you because Jesus Christ on the cross bore the guilt of sin and answered the demands of law and justice. And therefore, God can pardon you without violating anything that he is. You need to know those things. You're a sinner. God is just. He demands that either you die or Christ dies. Christ died as a substitute for sinners, and he is your only hope. Brethren, this is the plain man's pathway to heaven, isn't it? we don't need to make it sentimental and stupid. We just need to declare it in its biblical simplicity. Know your need and understand that God has made provision for that need in Christ. It's a call of knowledge. It's also a call of faith. If there's anything clear in the book of Romans, it's this that the only way a sinner can be saved is by faith alone. So it's not my works to please God along with Jesus. It's my works left at the door, abandoned because they're hopeless. And all of my hope instead placed upon the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul has this way of stripping us bare with the use of this concept of faith. There's no room for boasting. There would be if salvation were by works, but there's not because salvation is not by works. Salvation is by faith. And when we come to this chapter, he hits us three times in three verses with the demand that, that we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen again, verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. To call upon the name of the Lord is to believe. And then he says it again in, in verse uh, 11. Or sorry, verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. 
And again in verse 3, or verse, uh, thir uh, verse 11, for the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Children, think of gunfire. If I was to take a gun, semi-automatic gun, and pull the trigger, bang, 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 three times in a row, in quick succession, you would hear the crack of the shots. And Paul's just done that with this word believe. Verse 9, verse 10, verse 11. Believe, believe, believe. And then verse 13, call upon the name of the Lord. What does he mean? He means that the call upon the name of the Lord while a prayer is more than a prayer. It is a believing acceptance that Jesus Christ is your Savior. And it is a confident abandoning yourself to Him and resting the whole of your soul's weight for salvation upon Jesus Christ alone. On the one hand, this cry has desperation in it. It's the cry of a lost and perishing soul. And so it arises from our hearts, Lord, save me, I perish. That's what it means to call upon the name of the Lord. But while it has desperation in it, it also has confidence in it. Because faith is not just a blind leap in the dark. Faith stands upon the revelation of God in Scripture, and therefore it is a leap into the light. It is a leap into the arms of an all-sufficient and infinite Almighty Savior that we know and are confident is able to save our souls. No point saying to somebody, well, just believe in Jesus, and they don't know who Jesus is, and they don't understand what Jesus has done. That's a leap in the dark. That's not faith, nor is it salvation. But declare the gospel, and trembling, desperate sinners can with confidence jump into the arms of an infinite and almighty Savior. It's a call of knowledge. It's a call of faith. But it's also a call of devotion. Here in verse 13, it is the first response to the gospel. We might call it the first act of faith. But that cannot be separated from a life of ongoing commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, that's what we're beginning when we call upon the name of Jesus. We're not buying a spiritual insurance policy. I've said the prayer, tick the box, all is well. We are coming and calling so as to commit the whole of our life to God. Well, you know this term, call upon the name of the Lord, is used that way from the very beginning of the Bible. Listen to what we read at the end of Genesis chapter 4. Cain has killed Abel and has been himself banished because of his sin. And the Lord gave to Adam and Eve another son in the place of Abel, whose name was Seth, or the appointed one. And in Genesis 4, verse 26, we're told, And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. So our phrase goes way back beyond the prophecy of Joel. Right to the book of Genesis. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. What did it mean? It meant that they began to formally gather together, commit themselves to obedience and worship God. You have it in the, the Old Testament. But you have it also in the New Testament. Listen to how Paul addresses the church in Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 1 and 2. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God which is at Corinth, 
to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all, that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Paul's doing the same thing. He's using this phrase, call upon the name of the Lord, to signify those who have been separated unto God and have committed their life to him. They're devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to understand that as well. That to call upon the name of the Lord is a call of knowledge. It's a call of faith, yet it's also a call of devotion in this sense that there is commitment in the call. We come to God through Christ for the forgiveness of all our sins, but at the same time, we give our lives to God through Jesus Christ. We begin a life of public confession with the mouth that we are Christ's. I must then ask you this morning, have you so called upon the name of the Lord? Have you called upon him with knowledge? Have you called upon him in faith? Have you called upon him so as to commit the whole of your life and your eternity to God through Jesus Christ? The need of the sinner, the name of the Lord, the call of the soul. But finally, the promise to all. Because we're sinners, we need to call. God tells us who we are to call upon. We've explained what the call is in those three elements, but surely a a pressing question is this. Who, Who can call upon the name of the Lord? for this salvation. And it's here we have that glorious whosoever. Now to take you back a few minutes, remember we had an awful whosoever that came to us in the law. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is transgression of the law. And the whosoever of the law condemned us all. We are all lost. But listen to the glorious whosoever of the gospel. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now he says that on the back of verse 12. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. And he said the same thing way back in chapter 3, didn't he? For there is no difference. But there he was telling us that there was no difference with respect to sin. There's no difference. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And now he's saying here in verse 12, there is no difference that all who have sinned and come short of the glory of God have the same access to the mercy of God that is declared unto us in the gospel. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I trust you see it's a universal assertion. It's telling us that to to, to whoever salvation is preached to to whoever salvation is offered to is in terms of this word, whosoever. You know, brethren, there are so many examples of this throughout Scripture. We looked at the whosoever's of the law. It'd be good to spend time just thinking about some of the whosoever's of the gospel. What about John chapter 3, verse 16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John chapter 3, verse 16. 
You go one chapter further, John chapter 4, verse 14. Whoever, whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him, the same shall be in him a well of water springing up into eternal life. Whosoever drinks of this water. John chapter 11, verse 16. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Or what about Isaiah chapter 55? It doesn't use the word in English, whosoever, but it's the same word and concept. Ho, oh, everyone that thirsts, come ye to the waters. And it seems Jesus takes that very verse up in John chapter 7 on that last great day of the feast where he stood in the midst of the people and he said, if any man thirst... Let him come unto me and drink. Ho, oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. If any man thirst, let him come unto me. And God keeps saying the same thing over and over throughout the whole of Scripture. Sometimes it's as if he has nothing else to say unto sinners than come. What about Revelation chapter 22, verse 17? And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. There are no fences here. There are no walls here. There are no boundaries here. And I would say with the word of God this morning, away with every roadblock that men erect for sinners on the pathway to Jesus Christ. Because God says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. None are excluded. This offer goes out to all, whether they were Jew or Gentile, women or children, male or female, thieves or kings, educated or illiterate, cultured or simple. God simply throws the door of mercy wide open. As wide as this word, whosoever... And he says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's a universal assertion. But it's more than that, it's a personal invitation. If it's universal to all, then it must be inclusive of and personal to you. It's both general, but it's also direct. Sometimes in Reformed churches, people have a hard time balancing all the various strands of truth. They get themselves into a bind both in preaching and hearing. And the hearer wonders... If God is sovereign and election is true, how do I know that I have warrant to come to Jesus Christ? And the answer is that your warrant is not found in the doctrine of election, but your warrant is found in, this, in the free, unfettered offer of Jesus Christ to you in the gospel. You have people second-guessing, trying to work out if they're elect before they come to believe in Jesus. And that is an eternal fool's errand because the only way you can know you are elect is by coming 
to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's as though they want to hear God speak their name. If only God would speak to me. I've heard people say it many times. But God is speaking to you directly and personally here. This is your name. This is all of our names. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You cannot exclude yourself from that word. You cannot do it. But you can exclude yourself from Jesus Christ by not obeying the command of this text, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's not God who's shutting the door against you. He has flung the door of mercy wide open. It's you excluding yourself and shutting the door of salvation against yourself. And how tragic that when God comes to us in such free terms, so few people come to Christ. Spurgeon states it well when he says that it is, it is sorrowful to think of the breadth of gospel grace and the narrowness of man's acceptance of it. The feast is great. The guests are few. I see an ocean of mercy without a shore, and on it floats an ark wherein few are saved. Get into the ark today. Call upon the name of the Lord. Come to Jesus Christ. For why will ye die? Come to Christ because Christ is rich. There is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all, listen, is rich unto all that call upon him. His mercy doesn't run out. He's able to save every single sinner with all of their sins, no matter what they are, if that sinner will but come to him through faith. Therefore, you're not too sinful here this morning. Your circumstances are not too difficult. Your life is not too complicated. When you start to think, what will happen if I come to Jesus Christ? What are the implications for my job? What are the implications for my family? And those things keep you back from Christ as if you don't believe that God can deal with those things? It's another glorious word, isn't it? Not just whosoever, but this Lord is rich, rich, infinitely rich unto all that call upon him. Come to Jesus because he's rich. Come to Jesus because he's ready. Ready to receive sinners who come to him. He delights in mercy. He waits to be gracious. And when his name is declared, as it has been week after week, in this place for some time, it's so that you might step out upon this promise and come to Christ and find it so, that he is rich to all who call upon him, that he is ready to save all that come to him through faith. Here's a promise to you all, therefore, today. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's stand for prayer.